pa, 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 pa. It's time for nine o'clock coffee. Uh, let's see, it's uh, the 18th of July. It's National Strawberry Rhubarb Wine Day. I wonder what that tastes like. Coming up today, what's the 1111 on time? It's kind of like what's on the 411 on time. <laughs> uh, who's your spirit? Uh, Mandela effect, what's changed since the last time we had the Mandela report? Mandela effect report. Stop snoring, T minus a thousand years and faster than time. Check by later for links in the description after the stream is over. Uh, it's about stuff I'm passionate about, honor and health, humor, science, and God and you guys. I don't talk about politics nor the virus is going around. And most of the stuff about God is at the end. So if that causes you to get out of phase, that'll be time to hop in your TARDIS and head on back to Gallifrey. It's a reference to the Doctor Who, for you Doctor Who fans out there. I haven't watched it since they got a female Doctor Who. I just... That was just kind of over the line for me, I think. So that was it for Doctor Who for me. Check by later. Oh, I did that part. Oh, well, I got my coffee going. Let's yeah, see. Can you see that coffee? Is that coffee? I got to tilt it. Let me probably drink some out of it. Let's see. What the day? Well, it's National Caviar Day for you highbrow people out there. And it's uh, National Sour Candy Day for you lowbrow people out there. <laughs> it's National Woody Wagon Day. I always have a, a fascination for uh, those Woody station wagons. If I, if I could uh, pick up a car uh, and it could be any car, I think it would be a Woody station wagon. I really like those things for some reason. Very nostalgic feel to it. It's uh, also uh, Nelson Mandela Day. And it doesn't have to do with the Mandela effect. This is actually has to do with Nelson Mandela. Uh, it's also Perfect Family Day. I used to kind of whine and complain to my wife about neighbors that we that I thought were perfect. They always seem to have the perfect kids, <laughs> perfectly dressed, perfectly behaved. And I'm going, eh, well, how come our family can't be a perfect like the perfect family? Remember that, honey? Uh -huh. Yeah, she's over there. <laughs> Perfect family day. Uh, toss away the should have and could have days. That's a good day. It's a good day for tossing away the the uh, days that we regret. You know, the, Jesus said something about not being able to not uh, that those that fit for the kingdom are not those who look back aren't fit for the kingdom. Whatever that means. So it's uh, and then uh, where are we at here. And a World Listening Day, which has to do with just listening. Kind of listen around. We got those bugs that we got in the middle of the summer that make, always makes me feel like it's hot. I hear them out at the beach all the time. I don't know what they call them. You can hear them in the background. And then we got the birds. I like the birds, but it's those other, those bugs makes me feel like it's hot. Okay, let's see. It's Insurance Nerd Day. Uh, July the 18th is Insurance Nerd Day, created in 2016 to celebrate everyone employed in the insurance industry. It originated as a social media campaign to dispel the myth that insurance is a boring career path and to attract young people entering the workforce. Since then, the movement has been gaining momentum, and thanks to the efforts of a dedicated group of self-described insurance nerds, has become an annual holiday. I would think that'd be the same thing for like accountants. I always thought accountants had that problem about things being boring. And that's the rest of the story. Okay, well, comedy right, I got the Manslater, which is a, a funny little uh, comic routine about a device that is used for uh, translating what a man, translating what a, a what women say, what are they in they say something, but they mean something else, and it's the manslater translates that. So you can check that, check that video out in the comedy right. So what's going on? Well, that's the last time I talked to you guys. It was the day before Easter. 
And I thought I'd be doing these more often, but I ended up getting a lot of work. I've had more work in the past six months than I've ever had. It's, it's been crazy. And I think it's because primarily because um, uh, some of my clients are employment agencies and their clients want to give bonuses to their employees for working during this strange time. I gotta adjust this, it's not quite right here. And consequently, I had to do a lot of programming to, so that they could do handle all that. And it's given me more work. God, I guess it's been crazy, crazy work. And I've uh, been gaining weight. I didn't put on as much weight as I thought I was because I hadn't. I just stopped watching my weight when COVID-19. I was going to talk about that. I had just say since Easter, I haven't been watching my weight. And I'll put on about five pounds, maybe a little more. So I got to start worrying about getting that off. I, you know, I talked about work being crazy. Uh, there's, a, there's a video down below that, I, that um, I found very interesting. I ran across it yesterday. I'm kind of excited about it. I'm a snorer. I come from a long line of snorers. My whole family uh, growing up snored. My mom snored louder than most of us, I think. And uh, my wife's been suffering from the fact that I snore for a while. And it turns out that uh, if you're, um, and you'll find out more about it from the video, but if you if you're breathe primarily through your mouth, it actually causes your face to grow in different areas and this, it promotes snoring. And it, uh, there used to be a joke about my brothers, the Hargett boys and my family about having what they called the, 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 my, our in-laws or or their wives, my brother's wives, would refer to it as a Hargett drop jaw. That we watch TV and we'd sit there with our mouths hanging open. And consequently, they all snore too. But it turns out that if you breathe through your nose and make a practice of it, that it actually changes the structure of your face so that you stop snoring. So check that video out below. Uh, and I was going to tell you the story about snoring. I was when we were down at visiting uh, Sheila's sister one time, and and uh, cramped for space that trip for some reason. So it was Sheila and I were in the room, and Joel and David were sleeping with us, and they were sleeping on the floor. They were like two and four, and no, I guess a little older, maybe three and three and five or four and six. <laughs> anyway, I was I was laying in bed. And all of a sudden, I wake up for some reason. I'll tell you, we'll get into that in a minute. I'm always just sitting there. All of a sudden, I wake up, and there's this silhouette hovering above my bed. And I hear Joel shout, Stop snoring! And the, the whole room just busted out laughing. I guess you had to be there. It doesn't sound very funny now. Uh, but it made me laugh. <laughs> didn't scare me, but it made me laugh. Anyway. Uh, we watched the movie uh, Hot Rod yesterday, Sheila, Sarah, and uh, David and I did. I hadn't seen that movie before. It's pretty funny. It had some rude spots in it, but it was it was pretty funny. It kind of reminded me of Napoleon Dynamite. That's uh, uh, more about that later. Um, let's see what else we got going here. And been to the pool this year. Usually, I got a nice tan going by now. And a, Usually go to the pool about every every day or every other day. I hadn't been yet because I was primarily from all this work and this craziness also that's been going on. So that's the first time probably in ten years I hadn't gotten a tan by July. I guess crazy. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Eleven eleven. Last night I went to bed. Looked at the clock, it was 11.11. I don't know how many people y'all have seen 11.11 or 1.234 or 1.11. I've been seeing 11.11 since uh, uh, Linus and I used to hang out. Uh, when I was living out at Rainez when I was in college, we saw 11.11. It was when we start, first got those digital clocks, you know, the kind that flipped. And we started using 11.11 as uh, kind of like a drinking game. If we saw 11.11, you we could have a beer. <laughs> Grab a beer. 11, get a beer. <laughs> And uh, later on, after the Lord got a hold of my life, uh, Sheila and I would see 11:11, and we would start praising the Lord on it. We'd 
felt like the Lord was directing our eyes to the clock at 11 11. Uh, ever since then, though, uh, when we see 11 11, we'll just kind of shout it out 11 11. Last night, saw 11 11 right before I went to bed. And this morning, got up, looked on Facebook. There's an article by or a post by a Christian friend of mine about 11 <laughs> 11. So I uh, responded with my stories about 11 <clears throat> 11. If you haven't seen 11 11, Start seeing it. You're gonna start seeing 11:11. When you look, least expect it, you're gonna look at the clock, and it's gonna be 11:11. Let me know what you think about it. 11:11. Uh, this has to also uh, we mentioned the Mandela effect. You know, a lot of y'all might not know what a Mandela effect is, but the Mandela effect is this idea that history has been written, rewritten, and this kind of fits with what I'm gonna be talking about later. In the God section, uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? That's weird. Mandela effect. Oh yeah, the Mandela effect. That time's being re time has been rewritten. Now, a lot of people think it has to do with the uh, particle collider that they got going. That somehow it's swapped us into another universe or something like that but there's a lot of things that that uh, uh, reasons why they people think the Mandela effect is real one is that uh, Nelson Mandela a lot of people in their their memories of Nelson Mandela is that he died in prison but he didn't die in prison he got out of prison and he ended up becoming uh, president of South Africa and then they started noticing a lot of other stuff, like the uh, the Berenstein Bears, which is not really the Berenstein Bears, it's really the Berenstain Bears, but a lot of people might remember it as the Berenstein Bears. Uh, there's some biblical ones that you might not know about, too. Uh, you remember the scripture verse that says the, the lion and the lamb will lay down together? Well, it's not the lion and the lamb. When people think... It's being rewritten. So it's, uh, this is uh, Isaiah 11, 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatting together, and a little child shall lead them. So it's the wolf and the lamb, not the lion and the lamb. And there's also uh, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before, what, a fall? <laughs> No, <laughs> pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. People assume that time is a, oh, this is a quote from uh, Dr. Who. <laughs> People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, says the 10th doctor in a 2007 episode. But actually from a nonlinear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. And that's what went. There's an app for that. I ran across an app last week. Uh, one of the clients that I have um, it was uh, promoting using this app for storing passwords. It's a free, free application that you can download for your PC or your or your uh, phone. And it's called. Y'all probably a lot of y'all probably already know this. I've just I, I just been managing passwords in my head, uh, but the name of this this app is LastPass. It's a free app. You know, all you have to do is remember a master password to get to all your other passwords, and it'll plug it in for you on in your web browser, on your phone, or on, on your PC. And it does other things. It allows you to share share passwords with other people and stuff. So check that out. It's LastPass. One word. They blinded me with science. I got a couple of two or three videos for you today. One of them is how can so much of science be wrong? And this is by a, a pointy headed kind of guy who's knows that science can be wrong, which is kind of nice because, you know, most of the time if you t say science is wrong then people view you as well, not all science is wrong. Of course, when I say science is wrong, I'm talking about science and science is different than just science. Science in quotes are where people think it's science and it ends up being wrong, so therefore it isn't science. And it happens a lot. And um, he, he talks about it. <clears throat> and then there's an, uh, um, another article, another video, is most published research wrong? Now this is, 
Veritas? No, I can't remember the name of the pe people that did this one, but it's, it's pretty good. And then a funny one that I published, I was stuck on here before, called Banned TED Talk, The Science Delusion, where he the guy goes over the fact that the laws of the universe don't seem to be fixed, like the speed of light and the gravitational constant, things like that. And get in some other, some weird stuff that we we kind of issue. I think there's a lot of stuff. Once we learn, as human beings, once we learn something and believe it to be true, it takes a lot more effort to unlearn it and learn something else. And it's it's unfortunate when we get hit with something that's not true and we end up biting into it and and uh, believing that. You know, a lot of people think that uh, the early Christians believed the earth is flat, and that's not true. They, they believed it was round. But then later, people started believing it was flat. And then they, and then the actually all these scientists that that discovered all these things were actually Christians that were saying like Galileo and stuff like that. That's when they find out that we weren't the center of the universe. When we found out the earth, that the sun, they thought the sun was the center and then the earth was going around the sun. And then we found out the sun was going around the the uh, the galaxy, the Milky Way. And then we found out, oh, well, it's actually this big universe that's constantly expanding and there's no real center to it. And then they discover that there is a center to it uh, based on quantitative redshift of stars. And it turns out the center is actually <laughs> the planet Earth. <laughs> so, but a lot of they, they don't really recognize that because they can't explain it. And they can't explain, oh, how can the Earth be the center of the universe? So anyway, it's a band TED Talk. Check that out. In case you missed it, there's some, some movies about time and time travel, since this is what this one's about. It's uh, about time. I put this one on here before. It's a favorite of mine. It's Donald Gleason, Rachel McAdams, Bill Nye, which yeah, he's one of my favorite actors, and Margot Robbie has got, uh, no, no, it's, not, it's more in a bit part, but it's this is an early movie for her. I don't think she was well known or known at all at the time this movie was known. So it was one of her first movies, I believe. About Time, A Blast from the Past. This stars Christopher Walken, Sissy Spacek, and Brandon Fraser, and Alicia Silverstone. And it's not really a time travel movie. It's more about a nostalgia movie about the 50s. Um, but it has the word past in it, so that kind of first time. Then there's Napoleon Dynamite. Now, I got Napoleon Dynamite in here because I saw Hot Rod yesterday, and the Hot Rod kind of reminded me of Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, so check that one out. If you haven't seen Napoleon Dynamite in a while, I know I put him on this several times before. And then got Hot Rod. Now, Hot, Hot Rod's got some rude spots in it, but it's, it's still a pretty funny movie, especially the, the guy falling down the hill is just hilarious. I, could, I couldn't catch my breath last night watching that. And then... One that I'm pretty sure none of you have ever seen. I can't even find it on uh, IMDb. And that's Time Rider. This was a movie that was produced by not Mike Nesmith of uh, the Monkees fame back in the early 80s. And I think he was trying to piggyback off of uh, Back to the Future. It has to do with a guy riding a motorbike that ends up going back in time. He gets caught in, uh, he's out in the desert and he gets somewhere where he's not supposed to be, where they're conducting time experiments. You might recognize the actor in it. Uh, I can't remember his name, but everybody else are bit parts, and it's a B-movie. I think you can probably find it on YouTube to watch the whole thing, but Time Rider. YouTube this Christian Library, and what you'll find is a, a YouTube channel that's got lots and lots of teaching videos. Uh, the, the main reason I use it is to listen to uh, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee was a um, uh, pastor who retired, and once he retired, he felt like the Lord wanted him to go through the Bible in a year. So he did a radio program, and he would go through the Bible in a, in a year and explain all the verses as he went. And after the year was up, he decided he was going to do it again, but do it over a five-year period. So he goes through the Bible verse by verse, over a five-year period, one book in the Old Testament, one book in the New, or is it two in the Old, one in the New? Well, anyway, alternates back and forth from 
from Gen from uh, Old Testament to New Testament. I must have been through this thing uh, with him, not consistently every day, but uh, at least five or six times. Uh, it was one of the first things I started listening to uh, in the early 80s when the Lord turned my life around. And I, I think it was probably the most instrumental thing that I that I did for learning for learning scripture. And uh, he's, they're still doing his broadcast. He's on um, 92.5 up here. Well, I think it's in, not sure where that is, but it's 92.5 FM. It's a Christian station, BBN, on, at 12.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Fridays. And on 12.30 on Saturdays, he does question and answers. He passed away in 89, the year my wife and I got married, but they've still been doing his broadcast. This program's going on strong. As a matter of fact, his, his uh, program is on in you know, like, must be every country in the world right now, but they, in translated, they have a, you know, a different guy that actually does the teaching and everything, but it all stay, stays true to his, his teaching. Now, he's a fundamentalist. He doesn't believe too much in the spiritual side of things, but I'm not one that throws the baby out with the bath water. Um, I used to be a fundamentalist. I'm now what I call a fundamistic. I believe in scripture. I believe this, all scripture is true and you need to stick to scripture. But Christians are spiritual beings, which gets into what I'll be talking about a little bit later. Oh, uh, the Christian library. Uh, you'll find a link under the Christian library to a playlist by J. Vernon McGee for the book of Revelation. And that will be a really good book to uh, read and have explained to you, or at least an explanation. Some might, some might not agree with J. Vernon McGee's explanation. Uh, Sheila and I were fortunate enough to have a Bible, Bible teacher when uh, we met at a Bible study, and the Bible study the teacher at that Bible study knew the Revelation very well. And she she taught it, and it made a lot of sense the way she taught it. And J. Vernon McGee is pretty close to the same way she taught it. So, And it's the only book in the Bible that says you will be blessed if you read it. So if you haven't been blessed yet, <laughs> check that out. It, uh, I don't know how long it takes to go through it, but he, he has a half an hour program. Uh, the the library, the way they did the, the sound, though, is book by book, I believe. So this, a bunch of his programs put together. But check it out. It's pretty good. What the heck? Entangled pairs. I don't know how much of you guys know about quantum mechanics or quantum physics. But it's a pretty weird business down there at the particle level. It's, it's like they have, a, it's like there's a different set of laws down there. Um, the thing that's, I've, I've talked about it before, the biggest thing I think I've tried to explain is how light is a wave until it's observed and then it becomes a particle. Well, it doesn't become a particle. I keep saying that. But it's all, it was always a particle. And i give you an explanation of what I mean by that is light appears as a wave until it's actually observed and then when it's observed, it's a particle. But if it's ever going to be observed, it was always a particle. In other words, when life leaves a star millions of light years away and it reaches Earth, if someone sees that light wave, then it's not a wave anymore. It's a particle. And it was a particle when it left the star. And they've done uh, I'll put a link to the double slit experiment again if you hadn't seen it, but the double slit experiment pretty much explains it. And then there's one called the quantum time eraser, which is an experiment that the physicists did that prove that once something is observed, it was a particle and it's always been a particle. And they, they don't know how that works. And there's this thing called quantum entanglement, which is even a little bit weirder. It, it freaked out Einstein. He, he called it spooky action at a distance. And this is a simplistic way of explaining it, but if you can imagine a particle that is, well, you think of it as a, 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 a pair of dice. And no matter what you roll with a pair of dice, 
you bring it a seven. So if one dice ends up being a six, the other one's going to be a one. If one's a three, then the other one's going to be a four. And that's the way it works in the physics world when two particles become entangled. They're in this kind of a flux state that they call, um, you know, what do they call it? I can't remember the word. But anyway, it's it's like it can't be measured it's it's a it's like a probability wave it's like a, there's a it's like a, it's in a state of probability of being a six or a five or a four or a three or you know whatever for this for this particle what if you observe the particle then it's a value let's say six and that forces this other particle to be a one so if you take these entangled particles and put them millions of miles apart and observe one that are in these flux states and observe this one and say it's a five, then it's a 100% chance that this other particle is a two. And it doesn't need to be observed. It turns into a two. It's like the two particles are communicating faster than light. Now, they don't know how to explain this. They, th they think there's, there's some kind of information inside the particles that span time and space that communicate with each other some kind of like secret plan or secret information but they've disproved that too i just saw this video this morning that says that that's not the way it's working and i think the way it's working is is kind of interesting i'm not sure if it bears up under all the other uh, tests or the other uh, experiments they've done but what i think is happening is that time progresses uh, re can re progress reverse at the quantum level so that when so that cause effects effect follows cause but in the quantum world it could be the opposite effect the cause follows effect <laughs> and to, to explain it let's say that what when I look at when I look up at the light from a star and it's a particle and always been a particle, that's from my perspective, my time perspective. But if it was coming at me at a wave and then I looked at it, and the fact that I looked at it is the cause, the effect would be that it time would reverse all the way back to the star for the light particles viewpoint. Me looking at it was its beginning and it's arrival or de departure from this from the star was its end so it's like time's traveling in reverse so what that what does that mean now what it means is that it's a wave until i look at it and it turns into a particle and it's always been a particle from my perspective it has always been a particle from our perspective it's always been a particle even though it was a wave so in our memory it's like our memory doesn't get affected by it. So we, we know it's a wave coming at us. We look at it. It's a particle. It's always been a particle. So it's like either instantaneously it goes back into the past and changes from a uh, wave to a particle, or it's like a time, travel, time traveling in the opposite direction at the same speed. Regardless of how it goes, it left that star as a particle. And I think that's the same way that's what's going on with entangled pairs. When the pairs get entangled, they're in a flux state. You don't know which, <clears throat> you don't know what value either one of them, the, the pair of dice. You separate them. If you look at one, then it causes time to be rewritten. It goes backwards. Time's going backwards to when they were in, first entangled. And because the, when I look at it and it's a six, it's always been a six, then that causes the other one back in time to always have been a one. So it's kind of a, it's hard to it's hard to follow because you're actually thinking backwards with time, but it makes sense to me, and it explains something for me in scripture to think of it that way, and I'm encourage I want to encourage you guys to think of it that way because there's there's two branches of well, there's a bunch of branches of Christianity, but there's two of them that have been fighting for a long time, and you you can get in arguments and argue all day long about. Arminianism and Calvinism. You know, Calvinists believe that God picked us, picked who was going to be saved at the beginning of the time. And Arminians believe that we have free will and that we can 
um, choose to be saved or not to be choo- choose to be saved. And um, which is right. Well, there's scripture to back up both. Well, when do I have that? One is Ephesians. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Got off script here. <laughs> Uh, one is Ephesians 1 4. This is a big one for the Calvinists. <clears throat> According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So basically, it's saying that all the Christians that are going to be Christians have been picked by God from the foundations of the world. Now, is that true? Yes, it's, it's scripture. Well, the scripture. Uh, but also 1 Timothy 2.4 is true. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's will is for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a big Arminian scripture. So which one is true? Well, they're both true. And I use this quantum mechanics law to, pr- to, to give me a way of believing it. I can believe it. I can take it by faith not have an explanation and just believe it or I can believe it and figure out or let the Holy Spirit figure out how to explain it to me and I think this is the best definition it keeps me from being Arminian and it keeps me from being a Calvinist I'm neither one now I like it I like not being a Calvinist and I like not being Arminian so how does it explain it well if I don't if I'm in a a quantum state of being saved or not saved I'm unsaved or I'm saved. I don't know what my state is, my what my final state is. Then you could say that I'm not chosen by God and chosen by God at the same time. It's a quantum state, like with a particle. <clears throat> but when I accept Jesus as my Savior, then that's kind of like measuring the the particle, and it reverses time reverses until it gets back to when God chose who was going to be (laughs) saved and who wasn't going to be saved. And he picks me because I picked him. And I picked him because the Holy Spirit witnessed to my spirit that I needed a Savior. And I had a choice. So this gives you a free choice and it also allows God to pick you. So it it sounds like, it might sound to you like uh, I'm uh, just trying to figure out how to do but I am. I I want to do whatever makes both verses true, both scripture verses true. So that's the way I did it. It works pretty good, I think. Uh, You don't mean it. And this one's a simple one. Most, you'll hear a lot of people talk about the book of Revelations. And it's it's not the book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation. And it's it's short for the revelation of Jesus Christ, and because this is, the book is about revealing Jesus Christ, so it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. You could call it the revealing of Jesus Christ. So that's that's the uh, you don't mean it thing today. That's, I also got I got that link to J. Vernon McGee's video on our uh, teaching series on the Book of Revelation. <clears throat> now we get to the sermonette for today's God stuff. Whose spirit are you of? I've had this in the hopper for a while because I've been trying to figure out what 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 is spirit, what is soul. There's two different things. Uh, we're composed of three parts. We're spirit and soul and body, just like God is three in one. We're three in one. God's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You could say that the spirit is kind of like our spirit, and that the Father is kind of like the soul, and that uh, Jesus is kind of like kind of like the body. I mean, it's a loose comparison, but but we're three things in one. We're spirit, soul, and body. So when I die, I, my body is put in the gra- grave. So the Chris, the body is in the grave, but Chris, the spirit, and Chris, the soul is in heaven. So this kind of gets into what death is in scripture. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Because this thing is, the way I got this thing written, it's really kind of confusing. I kind of struggled with it. But uh, th- when you read in scripture about death, it doesn't mean cessation. A lot of times we think of death as um, kind of like the Energizer Bunny when the Energizer Bunny runs out of batteries. You know, he's dead. You know, when that's what we think. We we have a tendency to think that's what's going on with people. 
And when you die, you, your, your life force just goes away and it's done. But in Scripture, the word death doesn't mean so much cessation as it means separation. It means to be separated from. So when you die physically, if your spirit and soul separate from your body. And it's not a natural thing. It's an unnatural thing. Uh, to be, death is an unnatural thing. You know, God, uh, Jesus destroyed death when he rose from the dead. And, uh, but anyway, so that, I guess I'll have to get back on script because now I'm, I'm floundering. All right, here we go. Um, those of you, some of y'all might doubt that we are spirit, soul, and body. So I got some, a couple of uh, scripture references for you. Uh, the, uh, Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is uh, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So we got soul and spirit there. And of course, we, we, we know we got a body. We also got a heart. I'm not going to get into a heart this time, but, but that, yeah. there is another part of us, but that's not really us. That's a part of us. We, we, there is Chris the spirit, Chris the soul, and Chris the body. Three separate parts that put together comprise me, Chris, as, as a whole. A lot of times we're not sen we're not sensitive to the spirit. We're just sensitive to the fact that we're a soul and a, and a body. So, the word spirit in the Greek is pneuma, p n e u m a, where we get pneumatic from. It means a force of air breathed out. So it's kind of like a hard breathing, breathing out hard. So you think blowing out candles on a birthday cake. Suke is the Greek word for soul, and it means a light breath intended to cool something. So you can think of like cooling your coffee off or cooling your soup off. That would be the word suki, which is the word for soul. What do they both have in common? Well, you can't see either one of them, uh, but pneuma is greater than suki. You blow hard or you blow soft. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in Hebrew, there's two different words for soul and spirit also. This is Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed, and that's the word nefach. <laughs> that's a pretty good pronunciation. I don't think it was right, but it's closest I've gotten, uh, which is Hebrew, uh, into his, he breathed nefach into his nostrils, the breath of life, neshama, which is the word for spirit. And man became a living soul, or nefesh, the soul. Nefach is, means to breathe, blow, sniff at, seethe, give up, or lose life. Give up life or lose life. Neshama means uh, breath or spirit. And nefesh means a breathing, living being. So you can see evidence of our soul. Our soul decides on things like, I hate this, or I like that. And it's where our emotions come from. Your soul gets hurt when somebody calls you a name. That's that's pretty much your soul. What's going on? The spirit. I've been sitting there motiv. Uh, not motivated. I've been sitting there meditating on what the spirit is, and the spirit is what motivates us. Which I thought was kind of interesting. I it, uh, I felt like the Holy Spirit was really showing me that. The spirit uh, motivates us and reveals stuff from the other side, from the spiritual side to us. Um, evil spirits can affect you, motivate you to do things. They drive you to do things. And the Holy Spirit leads you into doing things. And it kind of reminded me of uh, Star Wars uh, when they were buying the R2-D2 unit. Uh, the R4 unit they got was R2-D4, I guess was the name of it. It was the going towards the hut. And all of a sudden it blows its top and Luke says... Uncle Owen, this one's got a bad motivator. So it's like, that's what the spirit is. The spirit is our motivator. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, it also connects us with God. It's the source of life. We use it to sense uh, things spiritual. 
and it motivates the soul. And according to John 4, it's how we're supposed to worship God. We're supposed to worship God in spirit. This is John 4, 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. Because Jesus just said, you know, if, I, if you asked, I'd give you a water where you would never get thirsty. So go call your husband. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, now, this is something I believe he was revealed by the Spirit. If you read Scripture and you read what how Jesus is described, he was a perfect man that had no sin, uh, and he had the whole, but he had the Holy Spirit that came upon him when he got baptized. And you can read about that. Um, I'll, I'll put a verse up there about that. But you can read in Acts ten somewhere. I'll put a verse in there about how Jesus walked down here on earth. And he didn't walk down here as God. So all this stuff that's revealed to him had to be revealed to him by uh, the Holy Spirit or the Father somehow. Because all he he just walked as a man. He laid down his, his, his basically laid down his godhood or his, what made him God in order to walk as a, as a perfect man. So he, he responds. So this had to be revealed to him by the Spirit. You have said, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. So that's, that's kind of like a word of knowledge. If you can read about that in First Corinthians, about the gifts of the Spirit, one of the gifts is a word of knowledge. And uh, Jesus walked in the fullness of the Spirit, so he didn't have like gifts. It was, it was the full thing. He, got, he, he had whatever he needed. But anyway, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem, the place where men ought to worship. You said that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, they, they, the Samaritans and the Jews, Samaritans were uh, uh, a cross between um, Philistines, I think, and Jews. So they were like half-breed type people and they worship they had their own place of worship in samaria and the jews and the samaritans didn't get out along at all and he, she's trying to pick a fight here uh once she found out he was a prophet in it and a jew but jesus said to her woman believe me an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in jerusalem will you worship the father you worship what you do not know we worship what we know for salvation is from the jews but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. <clears throat> so what kind of spirits can you have you got there's all kinds of spirits around me I, i'm not sure because i can't see them either i have to make assumptions um, i assume that we all have spirits even though they're dead they're not plugged into god but they're still there when i say dead i don't mean they're not animated and i, I, don't, I don't i'm using the biblical definition of death that they're se they're separated from god which happened when when adam fell um, but there's some things that I do know. I, you, you can hear people talk about things like this guy's got a religious spirit or this guy's got a, a spirit of rejection. You'll especially hear this with people that do deliverance, or have deliverance ministries. Uh, and what, what do those spirits do? Spirit of fear or spirit of religion or spirit of rejection? Well, they motivate you to be what they're named. So the spirit of rejection will motivate you to be rejected by people. They'll make you go around and do things that cause people to not want to be around you. And then the spirit of fear will be one that causes you to be afraid of nearby everything. Uh, spirit of religion usually comes across as a, a legalist type of person who... Uh, they, they might say they believe scripture, but whenever they run across scripture that contradicts what they believe, they ignore it or make an excuse for it. So 
So let's see, we go. Religious spirit, spirit of rejection, spirit of fear. God says that he did not give us a spirit of fear. So in 2 Timothy 1 7, it says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Now, let's, let's analyze that a little bit. Uh, a lot of people teach this a little wrong because the word fear really has to do with timidity. It doesn't have to do with being afraid. This particular spirit is a spirit of fear that is actually a spirit of fear. But there's also a spirit of timidity. And there, a lot of Christians fall into that category they're pretty timid with their faith they don't go around talking to people about faith they don't go around praying for strangers they don't go loving on people they just kind of stay back and you know, it's a private thing type of that's that's kind of a spirit of timidity this is god did not give us a spirit of timidity where am i but up 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 but of power and of love and of a sound mind for god has not given us a spirit of fear but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So the Spirit of God is, gives us power. That word power is dunamis. That's where we get the word dynamite from. So as Christians, we should be walking in power. We should be doing stuff similar to what Jesus does or did and what the apostles did. <clears throat> um, power and of love we love our neighbor, we love each other, we love God. That's the, the commandment that God gave us. Love God, love your neighbor. And of a sound mind. Keep our minds sound. <clears throat> this is Luke 9, 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should re be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is Jesus that we're talking about. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Remember, I told you about Samaritans. The Samaritans worship in Samaria. I forgot the name of the town and stuff, but they, their place of worship was in Samaria. And since Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, they knew he was going to go to worship in Jerusalem. And they were like, no, we're not going to mess. We're not going to. Take, we're not going to do whatever you need to do because you're going to Jerusalem. They did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw all this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? So it's basically saying, Lord, let us bring down lightning on them people. I'll, let John and I bring down lightning on these people. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. So they were, being, they were motivated to do something, but it wasn't motivated by the right spirit. And Jesus is pointing that out. And he says, uh, For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. In John 10.10, 10, we can see the difference between the spirit that God, Jesus had and the spirit that the world has because the world, the spirit that the world works by or is motivated by or allows to control them is uh, basically the satanic, the satanic spirit. And Jesus talks about this in John 10, 10, where he's talking about, he's comparing uh, himself to a shepherd and uh, the enemy as the thief. And he says, the thief comes to, to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that more abundant. So Jesus came to bring life, abundant life, and abundant life to us. This is good news. This is gospel. He came to bring us life and abundant life. Not just life, but abundant life. Now, when I say abundant, I'm not being a, the name and claim it wealth. I'm not talking about uh, prosperity preachers. I'm talking just talking about the fact that he wants us to have a full full, prosperous life, not rich, which is what a lot of people equate the word prosperity with, as if it talks about wealth. It's, pros, prosperous means successful. He wants us to have a full, successful life. He doesn't want us to be failures. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Now, look around at what's going on in the news and stuff and see who is it that's going around stealing, killing, and destroying. Those people, whoever is doing that, is not motivated by the Spirit of God. They're motivated by, by the Spirit of this world and by Jesus's, what Jesus said right here. 
The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that more abundant. If you see killing, stealing, destroying, whose spirit is motivating? The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2. So why aren't we aware of our spirit? Yet we are aware of our body and soul. Most of us are aware we have a soul. It's partly because we're ignorant of the spiritual side of existence. We tend to lump everything about the spirit and soul into a container and then call all that either the spirit or soul or use the terms interchangeably. But they're definitely uh, two different things. This is Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is alive and active. I've already read it once, but let's read it again. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Well, because we are born with a dead spirit, that's one reason that we're not aware of the spirit. The problem is we're all from the race of Adam, and Adam is known for having a dead spirit. And how did that happen? How did Adam get a dead spirit? And then how did we get it? How did we get Adam's dead spirit? And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now that phrase, thou shalt surely die, is not that in the Hebrew. That's the way it was translated. But in the Hebrew it says, thou shalt die dying the word death twice one in uh what is it thou shalt die present perfect or it stops you die and you're dead and then there's the other one where you will start dying so what happened there well what happened was adam's spirit died that day it was separated from God, and he started to die physically. And then 900 or so years later, because that's how long they lived back then, you might not believe it, but they did, <laughs> he dies physically. And what happens when he dies physically? His soul and spirit separate from his body. We're all descended from Adam, and Adam had a dead spirit. Therefore, every human born from the, his line has a dead spirit and would eventually die physically but one which was Jesus. Now Jesus, uh, that's why it's important that he was born of a virgin so that he wouldn't be born from the line of Adam. His father was not from the Adamic line. And it turns out the sin nature you see is passed down through the father's side. He's the only person in the world who was a, born a descendant of Adam, Mary, yet with an alive spirit because his father was the the, his father was the father, not a, a human being. And this is Numbers 14, 18. This is the proof that sin is handed down from father and not from the mother. It's uh, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. So let's say you're you go through life, you're, you're born, you go through life, uh, you get to be about old enough to know better, and you find yourself drawn to a particular kind of sin, maybe like witchcraft, or maybe you want to rob a bank or kill somebody or something like that. If you have a proclivity to a particular sin, you can thank one of your your, you can thank your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, or your great-great-grandfather for that because that's what they dabbled in and it's passed down. It's a pro proclivity to sin. Biblical death is, I've already talked about this, but biblical death is different than our cultural idea of death. And uh, I talked about how this it's not like a battery, but it's like being plugged in. Um... Yeah, I went all over this. Let's see. Oh, now this this is getting a little. This is getting into to my imagination a little bit on what the spirit looks like. Because the spirit looks like stunt something. You know, when Jesus showed up with the the uh, the maniac from the caves and can't remember the name of that town, Gerding. I can't remember his name. He had a, a legion of legion of demons in him. And as soon as 
Jesus shows up, he goes running up to him, and the demons start talking to Jesus. Oh, we know who you are. So how do they know who he is? Because he's they can't re they're not recognizing him physically. So I kind of believe that in this spiritual realm, they can actually see what you look like spiritually. And so I got to meditating on what it might look, what our spirits might look like in the spirit realm. I mean, as far as uh, physically describing it, as little as I know about the spiritual realm, I can't, I can't say for sure this is true, of course. So this is just some speculation on my part. But because we're separated from God, and God was a, kind of like a lifeline to us, I kind of thought of... Uh, how we were separated from God is like a like a cable that went went to God, and uh, then it got cut off. So, and it's kind of like trailing around, like we're dragging her around. And the enemies somehow can interface with it and motivate us to do things that we don't want to do. We don't have to do them. We just we can still have a strong will and say, no, I'm not doing that. And the Holy Spirit can can affect us that through that cabling or whatever. I kind of it kind of reminded me of the Avatar movie where they had that thing that they would had. I think it came off the back of their head and it looked like a tentacle or something, and they would join with like a the dragon or whatever the thing it was that they were flying, and then they could psychically connect, and become one with whatever they joined, and it kind of reminded me of that. So I was kind of thinking, maybe this, our spirit has something like that. I don't know. This is just speculating here. And then an, another thing made me think was uh, came to mind was octopuses and how they they can change their color and stuff so they can blend into their environment. And I was saying, well, maybe our spirit is like that. So they're like a dead spirit looks black. And then as we renew our minds and and renew our minds to to God. Um, they, we got like these spiritual pores in our spirit that open up and let light flood out. And this would explain why demons would recognize God and things like that. Where Jesus, when he showed up, and they go, wow, look at that, a bright, that bright being there. I can tell that's Jesus. You know, and they, they look at some lost person who's got a black spirit. You know, so, well, that's a lost guy. So, might have different colors. Who knows? Yeah, this is just some speculation. Don't don't think I'm trying to teach you this. It's just something I'm just jawing about. It's kind of like a rabbit hole thing. So anyway, it's kind of interesting to think about because you want to, I feel like we need to identify what part of us is spirit and what part of us is soul. And the spirit, God's supposed to do that because he says that, that the sword is, the spirit is like a sword that able to divide spirit and soul. And he's supposed to be the one that teaches us. So, Okay, let's back to this. If you're born again, all right, imagine the thing from Avatar. I'm just going to read this. Where the natives could connect to their flying thing or horse or whatever they became one with, their animal. Imagine being connected to God that way, but then you were disconnected. Your spirit was unplugged. If you're not born again, you're walking around with a loose end that the enemy can hook up to and affect how you behave. We call that possession or oppression. To the atheist or humanist, we're just a body with a biological process that keeps us going until we die, where we cease. We're only comprised of one part, body. To the majority, we're a soul slash spirit. Some people call it spirit, some other people call it soul, or they use them interchangeably. <clears throat> In a body, and when we die, our soul leaves with any number of destinations depending on the religion. We're body and soul. Jesus was always connected to God having an inact intact perfect alive spirit that he is always hooked up that he was always hooked up to with to god <laughs> and until the cross you remember in the, on the cross he says my god my god why have you forsaken me i kind of feel like it might have been a time when that was when god cut him off because god turned his back on jesus and treated him as sin as a punishment for our sin so a perfect man who had never sinned died so that we could live. And there's a scripture verse. I'll try to. I'll put that up in my notes, which talks about how Adam, because of Adam, we were all doomed. But because of Jesus, just as one man caused the doom of humanity, one man has caused the uh, salvation of humanity if we choose to believe in him. Uh, let's see. 
This is Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. It starts off with a verse I was talking about, the Spirit. I'll just go ahead and read it. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So he's saying that he made us alive, we were dead. See, that doesn't make sense. If you read that in Scripture and you think of it in our cultural terms, it doesn't make sense because I wasn't dead. I could say, what's the Scripture talking about? I wasn't dead. So, well, yes, you were. You were dead in your sins. You were dead to God. You were separated from God and in your sins. He and you, he made alive. Alive to who? Alive to God. We're connected to God. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. In which, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who we're talking about there. We're talking about the enemy, of course. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So this is a verse confirming that the spirits, the enemy spirits, can work in the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? Those that reject Jesus Christ, who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The faith is not even of yourselves. It's, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God poured out his, his spirit, on all flesh. You can read about that in Acts chapter 10. So we're all without excuse. His Spirit, ever since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the whole world and the Holy Spirit has been working on everyone to convince them to believe and to know that we are sinners. If we don't know if we are sinners, if we don't so that we if we don't so that we will be led to believe. <laughs> motivates us to believe and to know that we are sinners in need of a Savior if we don't believe. That's kind of interesting because a lot of people think well, you got to be, you got to be convinced that you're a sinner before you can get saved. That's what a lot of people teach, but that's not true. But it says here, and you can read about it, uh, what I'm getting ready to read right now in John 16, 8 through 14. And when he comes, he's talking about the Spirit, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. He's, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit poured out on all flesh. One purpose. Reprove the world of sin. So he's convincing everybody that they're sinners. And of righteousness. Have you been convinced you're righteous? Are you a believer? Have you been convinced you're righteous yet? <laughs> that's one of his jobs. And of judgment. Of, now the reason he... This is the reason he reproves the world of sin. Listen carefully. Of sin... Because they believe not on me. He reproves the world of sin because they believe not on me. Now, if you're believing on Jesus, is he going to reprove you of sin? Is he going to show you that you're a sinner and you need a Savior? No, because you already believe. Now, he, he will point out sin when, he, when it happens and we confess it and we keep on moving, but we're already forgiven of our sins. He reproves of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. He's got, to, he's got to show us that we're righteous because he's no longer here. To tell us that we're righteous. Of judgment, because of the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is already judged. He's already doomed. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So he's, he guides the enemy. The enemy 
the enemy uh, pushes. The Holy Spirit guides. The Holy Spirit leads. The, the enemy is... I don't know what the word... I can't think of the word right at hand. But anyway... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. This is interesting, because a lot of people out there talking to the Holy Spirit and trying to get the Holy Spirit to talk to them when he's not supposed to be doing that. He's supposed to be acting on it, like the connection between us and the Father. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. So he's like the, he's like the, the cabling that was broke. And he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Whew. I stumbled through that pretty heavily. I got Jesus on the streets. It's an interview with Thomas Fisher. It's a guy I like listening to. He's, uh, he's, he's good. I don't agree with everything he says, but you can't, you can't really find that many people you agree with everything they say. But just be willing to accept the truth and eventually you get there. But he's got an interesting interview on how he, he started praying for the sick. This guy's got thousands of videos on YouTube where he's been praying for the sick and they got well. So that's it for today. Thanks for coming. Father, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for making a way of salvation that is so glorious and so exciting and such great news for us if we'd only accept it. Uh, help us make go through the day loving on each other and accepting your truth. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you guys for joining me on 9 o'clock coffee. I always want to call it Saturday morning or something. Okay. How do you turn this thing off? Oh, there it is down there. <laughs>